Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be discovering what's in store for us in 2018. Most people may find a lot of uncertainty, you know, bad weather on the East Coast, President Donald Trump still in office running the country. We just don't know what it's going to bring for us. But perhaps it's going to be a lot more gratifying to know if we can get a feeling of what's about to happen that we can actually anticipate and prepare for it as well. Or most importantly, let's just kind of go with the flow. On our program today, we're going to be joined with someone who is part comedian, psychologist, and astrologer, but certainly all real. She's certainly someone who helps people turn around their inner observer to see things they say and do in a totally objective way. She's also been in private practice for more than 38 years by using astrology and her own system called the Four Elements as tools to help people step into their power. She joins us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today to deliver those predictions of 2018. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Deborah Silverman. Deborah, thank you for being on the program today. You're so welcome. Now, let's talk about, first of all, about the role of astrology in modern times. Is this something that's antiquated or is it still relevant? <laughs> Forget about astrology, it's just antiquated. <laughs> No, it's the oldest science on earth. It's the source that were long ago and far away. We knew there was a spiritual or an invisible overview that just got left out because somehow we abandoned our right brain and got stuck in our left brain, which is all about logic. So, yeah, there's a return. Astrology is coming back. It's been there the whole time, and suddenly there's a, a fascination or an interest. And I have a school, and I have a way of teaching it to people that's very practical so we can start applying it, not just let it be a woo-woo parlor game, but actually a practical resource. Now, you say practical resource. Let's talk about that for a little bit, because there will be a lot of times people will take astrology and its predictions quite literally. <laughs> As compared to? Anything else, I guess. <laughs> quite literally. Well, that, there's a reason to have it quite literally. It's an ancient science. There's definitely a source. I don't do predictive as in you're going to get sick on Tuesday at 3.30. It's not like that. I'm much more of a brush stroke, big, big storyline. But you can tell when cycles are going to change, and you can tell when there's growth that's going to happen or when things are going to go up or go down. So there are lots of indicators, and it is an ancient science. So yeah, taking it quite literally. I would take it quite literally. I mean, I came as a skeptic. I I have been an academic and trained with my left brain as well. But over time, over 40 years, I've been doing this for 40 years, you become really uh, well-sourced. Like, it's like there's no question anymore. Every single session I do, I've gotten validation. So I can no longer think of it as sort of a curiosity or an investigation. I'm now a firm believer. And I like when people are skeptics. You don't have to believe in this. Right. Just give it a try. Well, that also, you know, it helps give you a feel. It's a guideline, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. It gives you information mm-hmm. to think. It's not necessarily you have to follow it or it's a guideline. or It just makes you realize there's worthiness to put your attention on something and, and really ask hard questions and not just assume that it's bad, but rather actually do the inventory, do the research. So now that we're in 2018, what do you notice you would say would be major patterns that people should be aware of, pay attention to, things like that? Major things they should be aware of. Um, Let's see. Let's start with the planet, the collective, and obviously with our politics, that we are in a major, it's so funny we're talking today because there's a giant influence in the sky right now about government. And over the next two years, it will continue. It's just starting where it's the the honest um, questions about how will we survive a, break, a broken system. It's less about Trump. It's just more about we have to revisit how we're going to allow decisions to be made. And it's not here yet, but by next year at this time, the conversation of people wanting to intervene or step up or change the, the government style is going to happen because it's not acceptable that there is such a conflict. First of all, we're polarized. We're intensely polarized between a Republican and Democrat or between a conservative and a liberal. And that conversation not being in place 
where we can actually discuss things is going to create more and more and more tension. And that tension has consequences. It creates less and less communication. And it's like a broken relationship. Our government's like a broken relationship. We're not getting along anymore. So there's no question that just starting as early as this week, it's, I mean, it's just what happened with the Hawaii um that was such a great wake-up call. Here comes a, a terror into the collective. I happened to be in Hawaii when it happened. And there's this wave that went through, like, what? And then the reexamination of how did that button get pushed? And now a very deep conversation has to begin of who's in charge and where are the buttons and how do we make sure we're safe? So that's just beginning. We're at the beginning stages. It takes us a lot as a human species to change. We have to be in real pain or real terror, and it has to be in our face. It can't be theory. We can talk about change, but it doesn't happen until something really goes wrong. And we're coming around that corner, my prediction. Well, you know, and you mentioned, for instance, we've got Donald Trump in uh, office as president, and, you know, it takes a lot, as you said, for people to actually take action for change. Everybody wants to sit around and talk about it, but it's like a dance until somebody gets out on the floor and nobody else wants to really do it. Exactly. And I think what's really, to me, uh, interesting to note about Donald Trump, for instance, is he seems to be the first president we've had in, I don't know, decades, uh, you know, it's just a guess, who actually finally has this country talking. <laughs> you, know, you may not like what we're talking about or whatever it is he's doing, but at least we're talking, there's a debate, you know, there are things going on, things that we're you know, up in arms about. And it's about time, basically what I'm trying to say is the country seems to be, well, at least somewhat awake. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think you're absolutely right. That's what I'm trying to say, and, you, and you're echoing it. So if the provocator or the stimulation is so um, uh, uprooting and we start to really examine things, then it's a job well done. We had to, We were sleepy. And now we're waking up, but we wake up inside of a crisis, and that gets activation. So I don't think the crisis is quite here yet. We're still in, we're just a little bit shocked by the fact that he won the election, and both sides, the ones that are happy, are like, "Whoa, didn't see that coming," and the ones that are sad are like, "Whoa, didn't see that coming." And now we're going to start dealing with, as you say, the conversation, and eventually there'll be enough stimulation to make us go into action, get on the floor, and start dancing. Now, what else do you see? Well, there's a really strong, I mean, the funniest thing that happened I thought was so amazing astrologically is during the week that Weinstein came out with that whole Me Too syndrome that's gone so viral, it was a change in the heavens that had to do with secrets. And so for anyone that knows astrology, the biggest planet in our galaxy is Jupiter. Jupiter's, some people say, 300 times the size of Earth. Some people say 1,000 times. It's hard to get the straight answer, but it's obviously huge. And Jupiter is the planet of expansion and honesty, and it's very large. It makes everything get exaggerated. And it went through the it entered for the first time in 12 years the sign of sexuality and secrets. So that was fascinating to me, and that's going to continue throughout this year of the feminine principle finally standing up and saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I can't keep the secret. I can't pretend this hasn't happened. I I don't want to be silenced." So that was an astrological easy. Um, correlation between the entrance of this expanded open door around sexuality and secrets and then this unbelievable public um, voice that came out with me too that was a fascinating one that was loud and then we have another one coming up this spring early may that's the first time in about 200 years this is a little interesting fascinating to me uranus it sounds so funny or uranus has been in aries for the last seven years, and that suggests a real change around the male. Aries is very male. It's the archetype for um, the warrior or the builder or the, the fighter. And so over the last seven years, there's been this real difference between male and female. You can really see the pendulum has swung where women are finding their voice and taking yoga classes and studying how to be coaches, and there's just a whole giant shift. And the men and the role of the warrior or the provider has really diminished in so far as women can do it with or without men before we were ultimately dependent. Now it's going to enter Taurus in spring, and this will be the first time in a couple hundred years. 
And this will describe a change to do specifically with money. So our economy and the nature of financial, of what the worth of gold and finances are, are really going to change for the next seven years in a big way. So that will be an interesting one to see because our economy has stabilized, obviously, since certainly since 2007 when we had that big dip. This wouldn't be like the 2007, but this will definitely be, a, I think, a, a worldwide change around currency and how we describe money. I have this funny feeling. It'll be so interesting to see what happens. And that will start in 2018, but it goes all the way to 2024. So it's another big cycle. You know, uh, I know that you have also merged psychology uh, with astrology, and I wanted to kind of touch on that, especially when we were talking about how perhaps the financial system or monetary system might change. And it's funny because a good few years back, people that I was hearing talk about how that needed to change were usually people who weren't good with money in the first place. And I thought, (laughs) and it's funny to say this because, you know, we really need to get rid of the monetary system, you know, because uh, for whatever reasons, but you, you took a look at their money habits and their patterns, and you realize, well, look, you know, if they change the currency system, you know, you really got to take a look at what money really is anyway. It's just a promise for something in the future, you know, and the fact is, is if you were able to keep your word in the first place and do what you say you're going to do, you wouldn't really be so concerned about whether we change the system. What would you say to something like that? Well, I, the psychological piece is really what fascinates me. I, I would say the biggest, that story about the people that's, I, it's hard to generalize who's saying what, but I, what I really find valuable is there's a psychological wisdom base that is in the archetypes that astrology set before us. It's ancient. It's the oldest science on earth, and it's a very profound system of understanding character. So it's more interesting to me of how do different characters respond to change or the change of money or the change of the government or the change of men and women. Certain characters are very good at change. They celebrate it. It's very easy. Certain characters are very bad at change. They they resist. They get really um, uncomfortable, just similar to money. Certain people are, someone once told me that if you took all the money out of everybody's pockets, and threw it back up, it would land on the same people's pockets on the way down. Because there are certain people that are drawn to money, they just naturally bring it to them, and others that are always suffering and, and uncomfortable with it. And this is astrological. You can definitely look at a chart from a psychological point and be able to say, this personality type here, they're going to be resisting. They'll say no, they'll not want change, they'll be playing it safe, and they'll be very conservative financially, for example, And this person here completely loves change. They are whimsical. They're airheads. They throw money around. And you can really look at a chart and get that information. It's very obvious. Yeah, because I remember I was uh, interviewing someone. This was probably about 15 years ago. And uh, he was someone who wrote a book about how to become wealthy, you know, and that sort of a thing. And I remember he made a, a, a statement where he says, you know, you could take all the money in the world, you could just put it all together in one big pile. And basically, you can go ahead and decide to distribute all this money out evenly to everybody. So everybody gets a fair, you know, the same, the same amount. And he says, in one year, you'll see the same people who were broke are going to be broke again, and the same people who were wealthy will be wealthy again. And I always kind of, you know wondered about that. You know, how is that possible? And then I started, it was based on that, I started paying attention. And I thought, you know, he's right, because it's all about a person's psychology and habits, you know, that sort of a thing. And it's funny when you think of people who, for instance, well, we even had some uh, acquaintances that were that very same thing. They couldn't stand money, but they were talking about all this money that was coming in for their business, which never actually happened. But, you know, it was just funny to see how people are when it comes to something like that. It's so true. I think it's so interesting. This is why psychology and astrology completely fascinate me. Like, how does that work? And and it's so predictable that people will either spend their money and be impractical. And and that's the hardest thing about astrology and psychology is if you want to learn a new skill that's the opposite of what you're instinctually built for, which will create growth and will let change occur, 
you have to walk upstream. And for most of us, we're, you know, to be perfectly honest, most people are, we have a lazy component as a human. It takes discipline and it takes a decision and it takes focus and it takes growth to really want to change, which I happen to be, a ch- and I love, I, it's so much fun when you can see something goes from bad to good. Mm-hmm. Like, like what a relief, but that's muscles. That's like working out. Like who wants to go to the gym? I remember being in graduate school when I was studying psychology, and I remember raising my hand and saying, "This is." They were saying well, the question was posed to all the students: Why are you studying psychology? And if you had a question you were pursuing, what would the question be? And mine was: If you know what's good for you, and you know what's healthy to eat or to do, but you don't do it, what part of the human psyche is built for sabotage? Like, why wouldn't we do what's the best thing for us? Why wouldn't we open our minds and learn a new skill set and change and do the discipline and the work and clean the drawers or clean the car or clean the income tax or do it? Like, why don't we take care of that stuff? That's so funny. That's yeah, cool it's so thing. true, too. See, and, and, and I, I'm glad that you have brought this up in a way because uh, when you think of astrology, a lot of times people think of that as a, I guess, parlor trick, if you will. And when you take a look at, as you said, it's been a system that's been around for uh, centuries at least. And when you take a look at it from the perspective of merging psychology, in other words, what are our patterns and behaviors, and you look at the, uh, the possible predictability, if you will, of astrology, you can see how you're being made aware of perhaps changes that are either coming or that should come or be made. And that being said, you know, as you said, start engaging that muscle. If it makes you feel uncomfortable, what are you willing to do to make those changes, you know, and strengthen that muscle, so to speak? Yeah. So so I can, I can look at a chart and say, you know what, your health, this is going to be a time period where your health is really going to be challenged. And now you have a choice. You could either really step up your game, take alcohol out or take sugar out or take weed out or do something that really says to your body, I respect you, I'll take care of you. And you can turn what would be a difficult time with health into a disciplined time, which makes it much easier. Or you could just ignore what I'm saying and you'll end up not feeling well and you'll slow down because that's what the lesson is. Whenever this transit happens that makes us ill, we have to take a re-evaluated, reevaluated look at our life and slow down and change. And So if you could see it coming and you could use that muscle called choice, you know, it seems silly to me. Why wouldn't we? Now, uh, what kind of people do you like to work best with? <laughs> well, you know, I have a, one of my sites is called the Star the StarCommunity dot com, and that's built specifically for millennials. Like I really had in mind that I wanted to be able to work with younger people who were just interested in learning astrology. And this great article just came out in the New York Times that millennials are now having more of a religious belief in astrology. There, there's a real appetite that they have now for that. Um, so I have a specific site and a fascination with younger people and helping them understand why they're here and who they are and what the time periods and what their vocations are and really giving them some good direction around their purpose. And that's that's one whole audience, and I'm very specific. I really enjoy millennials. I, they, they are so starving. They're so hungry to understand Tell me how I can follow through and and not be entitled and follow through in the name of my own goals. And I love helping people in that. Then the other group that I work with is more um, your age groups, I I see from the name of this, After 50, that um, I have a huge amount of women that are from the ages, I want to say 50 to like 80, who are studying with me, who have had a fascination with astrology forever, but in my school... Um, which is twice a year in January, end of January, and then again in September. These are these amazing women who had careers, and they probably had an interest in psychology or in astrology for so much of their life, but they couldn't learn it because the way astrology is presented in the books is very, very complicated. It takes a lot to get to um, study astrology without having a teacher. So I... Um, have a great respect for those women that are wanting to learn something to use their left brain. I tell everybody it's like having Windex, and your left brain has gotten dormant because you haven't been in school in so long, and 
you stopped really learning about numbers and math and you've kind of relied on the computer so there's like a dust in the left brain and then I give you Windex when you study astrology you have to learn a whole body of knowledge and it's very fun to learn because it's experiential you, know, you learn off people's personalities it's not just theory so I watch all these women that are 50 and older waking up and coming back to life and they lose weight and they fall in love and they return to their sexuality or they start exercising and that's really one of my other favorite audiences. So millennials and uh, women that have had careers that are looking to complement their career or add something to go back into the work field and make some money and I love those people. You know, and there's uh, something that we've uh, talked a bit about here on the program is that of the millennials, uh, of being entitled, uh, being passive, lazy, things like that. And, you know, when I was living up, for instance, in Portland, Oregon, uh, after Donald Trump was elected, there were a lot of rallies around that that seemingly were full of the millennial generation. And apparently it came to light that of all these thousands of people that were down there protesting him being in office, that mo- uh, it was estimated about 70-plus percent of them didn't vote in the fir- first place. <laughs> oh, no. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, if this is true, what in the hell gives them the right to go and, and, and feel entitled to rally against something they took no participation in in the first place? Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, this could be a problem. <laughs> I mean, there is a definite contradiction going on in our politics because there's so much noise and there's their action. But that's going to change, I'm telling you. And once we get to the point where it gets bad enough, things are going to change. And, and people will realize, oh, my God, I have to vote. Like, I think this election really changed, shifted a lot for a lot of us. Nothing will be the same. How about that? Right, no doubt about that. Now, I understand, too, uh, that you have a school. I do. So much fun. I have a school. That's what I was saying about the older women. So, But there's lots of millennials, too, in the school. It starts, um, the cart opens every year in about the second week in January and every year about the um, first week in September. So if anyone's interested, it's a six-week course. And it's basically it's called Applied Astrology. It's learning it so that it's practical. It's not theory. And you study your own chart. So there's only 10 people in the group. You, there's 10 people in each class and one mentor. And the mentor has studied your chart with me. So before you get there, they know what to look for. In each class, we isolate just one small bit you know, of the chart. And we learn it from a psychological point of view, like what's your shadow? What's your internal dialogue that keeps repeating itself? What's your life lesson? What did you come here to learn? What's your predominant element? So each class is designed. It's really fun to help somebody remember why they're here. It's right. important. Mm-hmm. Oh, fascinating stuff. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I, I would, I'd have to say, especially when we're talking about voting and participation in politics, that astrology also plays a pretty good role in that too, doesn't it? Astrology plays a, a important a good, role. A good role, you know, of astrology and politics. It does, but there's, I mean, certainly there are people in high positions, and I can never use names, that a consultant astrologer. Um, I think what really consult, what really has a, a big influence on politics is the zeitgeist, which is a bigger thought than individuals. Like we as a collective have to face our ignorance. It's kind of like I feel sometimes like we're teenagers as a collective, as a human condition. And we woke up during the Hitler era. We really saw our shadow and how bad we behaved. And then we kind of stood up and went, oh, my God, sorry, sorry, sorry. And now we're re-entering. There's so much genocide. I was just reading about it today. There's, there's so much crazy human nature has so much permission to act out in violence and to use free will for all the wrong reasons. So politics are controlled essentially by the zeitgeist or the collective where we are being forced to wake up inside the dream. And here's one more phase of it with what's going on right now in our country. So it's less about astrology affecting the politics. It's more about the collective um, greater, like we're dreaming together, and there's not enough consciousness. I mean, if that was all we had for our option, I always think about this. There's 270 million Americans, and we picked Trump and Hillary as our two choices. That was it? Mm Mm-hmm.
That is so bizarre. That was the two best we could figure out. That seems like a bad dream. Right. Huh. <laughs> well, I was back in the day, I remember interviewing someone who was a dream uh, expert, and he was talking about uh, when, as this is when George W. Bush was in, in office, and he says, but did we collectively dream this person into, you know, our reality, for instance? And you know, when you start thinking about that, you know, what he represented, you kind of have to wonder, yeah, did we? You know, and just as you said, these are the two best people we could come up with. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. So it says a lot about our level of consciousness. It says a lot about where we're at a species that we acknowledge as a collective. We put them in office and we voted him in and, and, you know, to his point, he won, so it seems, fair and square. I don't know if that's true. But the point is that we're in a bad dream. And as soon as we wake up, if each person listening to the show today asks themselves, am I awake? Am I making choices? Am I operating with free will? Is there a awareness enough for me to be able to take my power back? Or have I just been sleeping in the middle of this movie and given my power away to some word called government? Like, let's be very conscientious to choose what I eat and what music I listen to, and what I wear, and what I spend money on. And if we took the government back to our own hearts and our own free will zone, and we chose, especially around food, there's one place where as humans we've got lots of choice. And look what we do. I mean, we kill animals in the most harmful way, and we allow ourselves to do this incredible GMO where we're exploiting the seeds. We've completely altered, and there's... No action steps there to say, no, 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 not going to hurt this animal. If this animal was a friend of mine, I would never eat it. <laughs> well, you know, and you bring up something, too, uh, that's a pretty good point, you know, uh, when it comes to politics and decisions being made, is a lot of people tend to want to throw all this, you know, the problems up to politicians to solve, when the fact is, is if you just simply take action by your own choices, that you'll affect change, and one of those big areas has been food because of how people start wanting more organic, they want to get away from the GMO, that sort of a thing, or they want their own gardens that you know, and move in that direction. And you know, once people start doing that, especially in mass, there isn't going to be much of a choice. That politician is going to have to say, well, I want to do this because it's the popular thing to do. Well, of course it is because the change has already been initiated. You just want to keep your job. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's the prayer. That's my that's my job as an astrologer. I'm here to activate people's enthusiasm and passion and light the fire and say, "Come on, you guys, let's jump back into life with full consciousness. Do not fall asleep in the middle of this movie." It's like the alarm that went off in Hawaii. It was so crazy, like screaming, "Alert! Alert! This is not." A, it's like there is going to be a 15 minutes hide because there's a bomb coming. That was the wildest moment. And it was an alert. It was a wake-up call. Like, what What happened? I mean, I don't know that it worked, but it was certainly an attempt by our dream state. So, yeah, that's my job, giving people enthusiasm and saying, get up. You guys don't fall asleep in the middle of the movie. Right. Now, is there a website people can find out more about your work, get connected, things like that? Yes. The uh, It's called Deborah, three words, Deborah Silverman Astrology, um, D-E-B-R-A dot com. You can go and you can see all the classes that I'm teaching and the different places I'll be and what I'm doing. You can also go to The Star Community, another three words, thestarcommunity.com, and you can see this website that for $22 a month you can actually begin to learn astrology. There's a a way to let yourself um, open your mind again and, and be you know interested, hungry to learn. So that's an option. Um, those are the two places I would suggest that you can. And then I have a YouTube channel with over, I don't know, six or seven million views of all the, I, every other day a video comes out that tells you where the moon is. So I do these things called lunar forecasts, and they're free, and you can find out where are the planets today. Far out. Well, Jess, thank you so much for joining us here on the program today, Deborah, and sharing with us some insights, especially when it comes to ourselves, because after all, Whenever you get predictions, it's best to kind of take those and say, okay, what area of my life do I need to strengthen and actually make those changes to to make sure that that happens. Absolutely. I love it. Deborah, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you. You have a beautiful rest of your week. Will do. 
want well, to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also predict one particular action you can take, which is to visit us on beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, so that way you can stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway. Halfway.